Good morning. Welcome to Asbury. We're going to kind of ease into some praise and worship. We're glad you're here. I don't know my paraphernalia. My text and stuff. Hi, Steve. We're missing you. Tell Steve we're missing Steve. down to the 
Back at the camera and wave at everybody at home. Um, uh, it's good to see um, everybody. Um, you know, welcome to Asbury United Methodist Church. And um, for those of you that are worshiping with us from home, uh, we are glad that you've chosen to be with us. And, uh, and, and we are honored that you've chosen to worship with us. Um, boy, I don't know about you, but I love the cooler weather already. I guess Tuesday is going to be officially the new, uh, the first day of fall. And uh, I am ready for it. Um, praise God. Um, and, and our roads getting fixed. You know, how about that? You know, that's going to be nice. Um, and the Cowboys play today, so... Hope they do better than last week. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys for the, the music to get us going and getting us in a worshipful mood. Um, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. So uh, this is the last of a three-part series uh, where we've been looking at Matthew and, and we've been looking at, at uh, how we're supposed to be uh, in relation to each other and how we're supposed to be in, in relationship with God. And so far we've learned how to handle conflict occurring within a, a church family. And we've learned about unlimited forgiveness, which I think is a very hard concept for us. Um, and so now today, let's turn to fairness. And I actually want to start uh, this morning in Matthew chapter 19. So uh, let me give you a heads up. 
The translation that, that I've been using um, more recently is the, the, the Common English Bible. Um, this is a newer translation. Um, and uh, it, instead of using the term that we're used to, the Son of Man, this translation uses the term the human one. And so you're going to hear that. Don't let that throw you off. So I'm going to begin uh, in uh, chapter 19, verse 27. Then Peter replied, look, we've left everything and followed you. What will we have? Jesus said to them, I assure you who have followed me that when everything is made new, when the human one sits on his magnificent throne, you also will sit on 12 thrones overseeing the 12 tribes of Israel. And all who have left houses Brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or farms, because of my name, will receive 100 times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After he agreed with the workers to pay them a denarian, he sent them into his vineyard. Then he went out around nine in the morning and saw others standing around the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. And they went. Again around noon and then at three in the afternoon, he did the same thing. Around five in the afternoon, he went and found others standing around and he said to them, why are you just standing around here doing nothing all day long? Because nobody has hired us, they replied. He responded, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the workers and give them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and moving on finally to the first. Well, when those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, each one received a denarian. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarian. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. These who were hired last worked one hour and they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to one of them, friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you a denarian? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I am generous? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. So just right before this, Jesus has told a story about a rich young man who comes to Jesus, and he wants to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him, you must follow the Ten Commandments. The man says, I, I've been doing that my whole life. Jesus says, well, then you also must sell everything you own, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. To which the rich young man just turns around and walks away. So different than the rich young man who walks away, the 12 disciples who are around Jesus right now, they actually have given up everything to Come and follow him. So they want to know what they get for doing what the rich young man was unwilling to do. They wonder if God is going to be fair. Now, the concept of fairness is something that we have all dealt with our whole lives, haven't we? I've said before, um, and I love when, it, when I bring a sermon brings up memories of my mom. My mom was a great cook. 
my mom made the best fried chicken I have ever had. And my mom made the best pies that I've ever had. Her chocolate and lemon meringue pies were just masterpieces. I don't even know how you make a meringue, but hers were masterpieces. But when I was little, all I wanted was a bologna sandwich. Anybody can relate to that? I wanted a bologna sandwich. I could have a bologna sandwich every meal and I would be happy. But we had a big garden in our backyard, you know, like as big as the, the community garden out there. It was huge. And so we always had fresh vegetables. Now, we ate in the kitchen on a yellow formica table with yellow chairs. Anybody remember those? Yeah. And, uh, and so now when my mom made fried okra, it was the best fried okra I've ever had. But when she made boiled okra, anybody ever tried to eat boiled okra? Oh, man. Ooh. So, so mom would come and she'd put the plate in front of me and I'd screw up my face, you know, like kids do. And, uh, man, I would put it off as long as I could, but the inevitable would finally happen. I, I, I would have to eat that okra. You know, mom would say, guys, maybe your mom said this too. You don't have to eat it all, but you at least have to taste everything on your plate, right? Mom still say that. So, man, I'd put that okra in my mouth. It was all slimy. And, and it would it would get down to about here and it would stop, you know, and I just I just couldn't swallow it at that point, you know, and that's when I would blurt out. It's not fair. My poor mom. I apologize, mom. I still don't like boiled okra, though. Um, and, but then do you remember being a teenager and, and your friends would um, would would be going to do something, and so you'd ask if you could do it too, right? And then either your mom or your dad or your mom and dad would uh, tell you no. And that's when you shouted, it's not fair. And even as adults, we still encounter things that just don't seem fair, don't we? I mean, you find out that somebody who does the exact same work that you're doing gets paid more than you do. You, you, you find that somebody else is going to get a promotion that you think should have gone to you. Somebody you thought was a friend turns out to be anything but. People judge you because you don't look like them, because you don't believe the way they do, or because you like something that they think is just ridiculous. You've tried to do everything right in your life. And then all of a sudden, you get diagnosed with some kind of a scary disease. You find out someone that you care about has all of a sudden died and you didn't even know that they were ill. Life just sometimes doesn't seem fair. And when it gets to you, you just want to scream from the top of your lungs, it's not fair. And I guess that's just a part of the human condition, isn't it? Life is not fair. And nobody said it was supposed to be. But when it comes to God, don't we want God to be fair? So I suppose it's a natural question for Peter to basically ask Jesus, how is God going to reward us for giving up everything? And the answer comes in three parts. First, in verse uh, chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus tells them, the 12, that they are going to be rewarded richly. That when, it, when the time fully comes and Jesus sits on his glorious throne, that each of the 12 of them will get to sit on a throne too. Each one of them overseeing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the apostles are promised glorious roles in the age to come. 
The second part of Jesus' response, chapter 19, verse 29, extends the reward to all of Jesus' followers. Not only the apostles, but all who sacrifice for Jesus' sake will be rewarded a hundred times more than they sacrificed, and they will inherit eternal life. And then the third part of Jesus' response comes in the form of the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And when we read this parable, it can seem offensive to us, right? Because it, it, it challenges our sense of fairness. And we can find ourselves empathizing with the workers who grumble because they think they deserve more since they've worked all day long. And so it begs the question, can God be unfair? Well, the climax of the parable occurs in chapter 20, verse 15, where the owner of the vineyard says, don't I have the right to do with what, what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I am generous? The owner of the vineyard claims that he has the right to pay the workers not based on their merit, but on the basis of his own compassion. Now, why would such generosity seem so unfair to us? The Bible opens with our God as the creator who is good and is generous to all. Hear these words from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 9. I will lift you up, my God, the true king. I will bless your name forever and always. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and always. The Lord is great and so worthy of praise. God's greatness can't be grasped. One generation will praise your works to the next one, proclaiming your mighty acts. They will talk all about the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will contemplate your wondrous works. They will speak of the power of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your great accomplishments. They will rave in celebration of your abundant goodness. They will shout joyfully about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, very patient, and full of faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone and everything. God's compassion extends to all his handiwork. Now, of course, Jesus believes in the God of justice. But in this vision of God, God's divine compassion greatly outshines God's divine justice. We who worship such a God are called to imitate this kind of compassion and this kind of generosity. The parable of the workers in the vineyard puts grace above rewards. Now, sure, the sacrifices of the apostles and other followers of Jesus will be honored by God. But the reward we receive will so far outstrip the sacrifices we make that it can only be seen as sheer grace, the amazing grace of God. Now, although some may feel that their long and costly service qualifies them for a higher rate of pay in the kingdom, everyone must humbly acknowledge that, in fact, we are like the 11th hour workers. Not one of us deserves the glorious future that God has prepared for us. For any who grumble, about what we think is unfair, such resentment can be overcome only by fixing our gaze on the goodness of our loving God, who is generous to all. Let us pray. Loving God, Abba Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, who is himself the answer to our prayers. Grow us up 
to want Jesus more than we want our solutions, to love him for who he is beyond what he can do for us. Come, Holy Spirit, and always give us this bread. We pray in Jesus' name. And now we continue to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to share in Holy Communion now. If you failed to pick up one of these little cups when you came in, then you're welcome to go back and get one now. Um, one of these days we'll get back to real bread and good old um, Reverend Welch's grape juice. Um, but I want you to think about the the goodness and the graciousness, um, the compassion of Almighty God. Not a single one of us wants what we deserve, but God, who is so loving, gives us the gift that only God can give. And so let us give thanks to our God. Let us praise our God. Let us... Um, um, be mindful to share with others out of the goodness that we have received. So we remember that night when Jesus was with those who he loved more than any others. And as they were having their meal together, he took bread, he broke the bread, he gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God. He gave it to them and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so almighty God, and in, in, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I invite you now to enter into a time of prayer, and you may take your elements. Um, you may stay seated, or you may come up to the prayer rail if you'd like.
the treasures of this life may fail, your love endures forever. Will pass away things man had made, but your love endures forever. Though I can't explain. Understand, he gave You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. And I will sing again. Lift him up. so good to me, you heal my 
died upon the cross. You are my Jesus who loves me. You poured out all your blood. You died upon the cross. You are my Jesus who loves me. And you are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. And I will sing. one of us has been blessed richly and the blessings are even going to be better in the age to come and we should be so grateful um, there's no sacrifice we could make that is going to come anywhere close to the joys that God is going to lavish on us and so we just need to share the good news with everybody we can show that same kind of compassion and generosity to somebody this week, um, whoever that might be. So for those of you that are worshiping from home, uh, for us here, um, when we leave this place, when you leave your home, wherever we go and whatever we do, how are people going to know that we are Christians? They will know we are Christians by our love. So here this is your benediction. May the grace of God the love of Christ and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.